all experiences we had, faith into a dream, the actions we do during those experiences do not fade. These are my notes that I, when I woke up, I wrote down. Um, everything that you've experienced from the time you were born up till now, many of those things, many, many details, you can't remember anymore. You can't. You can't even recall. In fact, when someone tells you something or reminds you about it, you go, oh, did that happen? Or sometimes little bits and memories come back. Even when we're a little child, things that we throw fits on. We threw our bottles down, we screamed, and we, 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 we hit our mothers and fathers that were so serious at the time, at that moment that was happening. It was so incredibly serious. But now it's just a distant dream. But us, being the bratty little kid, if we were, throwing tantrums and fits are not forgotten. And we would grow up as adults, and when we're temperamental and we're difficult and we're angersome, our parents or people who knew us would say, oh yeah, they were like that as a child. So what happens is, the point is, whatever we do, the experiences that we have fade away, and they go away and they disappear, and they don't matter anymore. In fact, by next week, you won't even remember we had a Dharma teaching this week. And for some of us, what was taught here and explained here today by next week is already forgotten. Well, that's not an insult. That's the way our mind works. So, unfortunately, the experiences we have, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, we experience the experience like watching a drama or a play. During a drama in a play, it's very intense. If the actors and actresses are really good, they make you cry, they make you laugh, they make you feel, they make you feel anxiety, you feel real. Why? Your mind is totally absorbed in that play. Totally. But when the play is over, the show is over, you come back to reality. You know that it was just a play, it was just actors and actresses. And sometimes when we hear about actors and actresses and what they do, you know, the, the bad little gossip magazines, we like them for a few reasons. I like them. I put them near my toilet bowl, so when I take my number two, I read those. I, like to, I can't bring Dharma books in there, so I bring the next best thing, samsara. So I have my little gossip magazines about who's having what liposuction, who broke up with who, who's, who's with who, who's suspected of this, and all that stuff, you know. And I put it next to my toilet and I, and I read it when I'm taking my number two. In any case, we like those and we read those and we feel interested because one of the reasons, not all, is that when we see these actors and actresses on the screen, they portray a very good person, a wonderful person, or a very rotten or evil person. They, they have a portrayal and we kind of identify them with the character. So when we read these magazines and they don't match the characters we identify with them, it find, we find it interesting. For example, you know, if you see an actress play a nun, a part of a nun and she was really holy and wonderful and blah, 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 like Audrey Hepburn, you know, the nun story. And then you, she's so wonderful and holy and fabulous and everything. And then you read in a magazine, you know, she's divorced four times. You're like, well, what kind of nun is that? And it, you find it interesting. Why? Because it doesn't match their character. So we, we like that. And that's something subconscious in all of us. And we're like, oh, they, they can do that. They can do this. And it's, it's fun. In any case, similarly, things that happen to us, good and bad, are like a play, like a show. Think about it how much intensity we put into the experience. How much intensity we put into the experience. The experience will pass. What happens will pass. And the person we had the good and bad experience with will pass and go away. And they fade into a dream. Think about relationships and friends and people you've known 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 4 years ago, a year ago. Some you can't even remember. Some you don't want to remember. They fade. And even people that we have relationships with now, in the future, there will be memories. Sometimes not even memories. But the actions we do with them do not become memories. What we do with people and experiences do not become memories. Example, if we're riding in traffic and someone cuts us off and we immediately aggressively chase after them, the chasing will be done. But the action of Anger and chasing them and wanting to get them and scare them and get them back and teach them a lesson doesn't go away. That action, why? We reinforce our anger. We experience the anger and we feel familiar with it. 
and there's no immediate repercussions, we engage in it again and again and again, till it becomes something very serious. Similarly, if we have a negative experience with someone, a negative experience, once it's over, that person is gone. Maybe we don't talk to them ever again. But the experience with that person is gone. But the actions we've done with that person is not gone. Whatever we've said and done, hurtful and damaging to the other person, equates or equals into karma. And that karma remains. And that karma goes on. And the horrible part about that karma is that they multiply daily. And the next horrible thing about karma is that they come back to us. So whatever we do with the person, whether it's our parents, whether it's our girlfriend and boyfriends, whether it's friends, whether it's social people, whether it's the, it's the fancy of the moment, it will pass. And when it passes, we can't even remember anymore. But unfortunately, the action stays. And if you don't believe in karma, it's OK also. I'm not here to force it down your throats. But if you don't believe in karma, you can believe in this. The action stays because you reinforce your action. Let's say if we're very attached to um, a relationship and we put all our energy into a relationship, it fades, it goes away. And all the energy and time that we put into a relationship is gone. It's totally gone. And if we try to recapture or get it back, it will be worse than before. It will never be like before. The karma for it is gone. Now, if we have a good relationship, and then we end it, and then we want another good relationship, we end it, we might come, and then we have this power of any relationships, or we have a power of not wanting relationships. What happens is, we'll come across one day that our karma builds up that somebody will tell us to get out, and we won't be able to take it. If we don't have dharma, we don't have a good psychological background, we won't be able to take it. We might go off the deep end, commit suicide, do something violent, hurt, get revenge. We can do a lot of things. So even so-called good relationship experiences ends up bad because they reinforce something that's not real. We cannot get happiness from a relationship. We cannot get happiness from money. We cannot get happiness from people, from outside things. Why? I'll tell you why. Because they don't last, number one. Number two, because these outer things are not permanent. Number three, the foundations that these outer things, such as money, reputation, family, friends, sits on is very fragile. Just like the tsunami hit, over 200,000 people died. Just in one hour, two hours. It's very fragile. It goes away. Although this building is very solid, it will go away. Although we think our bodies are very solid, it will go away. It will disintegrate. So when we totally focus on relationship and people and money and friends and reputation and cars and, and, and entertainment, as the outlet for happiness or hiding behind something because we're not happy, eventually we have to face ourselves. And when we face ourselves, you know what's the horrible part? That when the merit for those things run out and we don't have merit or karma for it, when we face ourselves, perhaps we cannot overcome it. And that's why people do extreme things. When the experience is over, what we have done creates a reputation for us that even before the actual results come, people form preconceived ideas of who we are and what we are and how they think we are. True or not doesn't matter. People experience us as we experience them. I wrote this this morning. And what does that mean? If you don't believe in karma, because I always teach on two levels, I share on two levels. If you don't believe in karma, it's okay also, because Buddha can be used as a psychology that helps. He's the greatest psychologist. He is a Buddha, definitely, but he can be used on different levels in a positive way. That's what he wants. Whatever experience we have, whether it's positive or negative, how we act during that experience and how we act immediately after that experience entailing and after that, after that, how we act in relations to what happened creates even more karma. That don't need to explain more. But on a normal, worldly, psychological level, whatever experience we have and the way we act and talk and show our face and, and show our body language at that time, during that experience, people will hear, people will see, and that will formulate their preconceived notions about you.
So if normally you're sloppy, you're unaware, you forget things. If normally you don't pay attention, you're not alert. If normally you're angersome, you react back negatively. If normally you're irresponsible. If normally you're very responsible. If normally you're very kind. If normally you're very gentle. If normally you're very skillful. If normally you're very enthusiastic to help. If normally you're very lazy and you hide and you say things and you don't fulfill your commitments or you push or you hide behind your fears. If normally you like that and you do that for a long time, that formulates the conceived idea about you and others. And that conception of you creates your reputation. And that reputation of you, true or false, creates more conce conceptions about you from others. And that conception of others to us is what hurts us. Because we always complain, I'm misunderstood. People don't understand me. And we spend a lot of the time of the day and we use our speech explaining ourselves to others talking about ourselves to others, justifying ourselves to others, and explaining and talking. But when they look at us deeply, we have no results. We have no results, but we're very eloquent in explaining why. And we spend our time on why we didn't get it. And we spend our time in explaining and telling. And then most of us, when we, those people who explain, usually have not accomplished anything in their life, but they can, they can explain why. But my question is, if you can explain why, why don't you have an answer to do something to change it? Since you know why, you must also know an antidote. So if you don't know an antidote, two ways. Find one in the Buddha or in a friend that has wisdom, but not stick to your narrow way of thinking and view and action because it gets you nowhere. Nowhere. No success. So if we have a bad relationship with our father, with our mother, if we have a bad relationship with our wife and our husband, if we have a bad relationship with our friends or people we meet and we're misunderstood, instead of always explaining, we need to understand that we created that reputation about us directly or indirectly. And even in this life, if you think yourself very good and you didn't do much in your ignorance, in your darkness, you think you didn't do much and that people just think like that and they accuse you, that also comes from a cause. Because however you are, maybe you're not consciously doing it, but you're subconsciously doing it on a conscious level without knowing it. Because people can misunderstand you by the way you do things. But should we spend the rest of our time explaining about how good we are? Or do we live in a world with a lot of sentient beings and we need to accommodate because we're social beings? Even in this life, if you didn't do much, Perhaps the habituation came from a previous life. You know, it's very big these days, past life regression therapy in America. Very, very big. They don't even believe in Buddhism and they use that because what Buddha teaches us is truth. It's not based on some religious dogma. It's truth. We do have past lives. We do. Many of the religious, major religions in the world accepted that at one point or another, but it was banned at one point or another. Why do I point religion? Because you get very wise people from religious practice because they settle their minds and they're able to reach higher states of meditation where they can hear, see, or contact deeper levels of consciousness in all religions. That's why all religious people of any religion can have religious experiences, see Mother Mary, see Tara, whatever. They can because once they reach a certain level of the mind relaxing through whatever meditation, they open up the subconscious. They open up deeper. They open up past life memories. And if we can remember things in this life, why, not, why can't we remember things from previous lives? It's only a matter of exercising that power of concentration. So if we have a difficulty with certain people in our lives or certain situations, or if we're not doing anything and we're accused and people say things about us, or people have a certain view about us, we have to ask ourselves, what did we do to create that misconception? If people think we're lazy, if people think we, we irk off responsibility, have we done that? If we have, we remain silent and change. If we haven't, instead of trying to justify what we've done, we should realize by the power of cause and effect that we have created this in previous lives. That habituation started somewhere, whether a year ago, two years ago, or three years ago, or a lifetime ago, 10 lifetime ago, it started somewhere. 
So people's preconception about us comes from the way we have reacted in the past to experiences. And the way we react to experiences and how we talk and how we do things is the notions, reputation, conceptions that people put on us. And then even people who didn't meet us, they'll spread your reputation out and add things to it. Learn about we say in Tibetan, add things to it and even increase what they say about you. So we have two ways. We can spend the rest of our life defending ourselves and putting all our energy and telling people how right we are and how we're misunderstood, but not put our energy because we only have a certain amount of energy and a certain amount of time. So if we put all our energy and time into explaining and justifying at the end, yeah, we justified ourselves, we have no result. If we're into material things, we have no car, we have no apartment, we have no partner, we have no friend, we, everybody's abandoned us, we're alone. Even the people that try to help us, we alienate them on a worldly level. On a spiritual level, when you die, maybe you get a good life, maybe not. Think. So if we have so limited amount of energy and time, wouldn't it be better to put this into transforming ourselves? so that the preconceived ideas about us will slowly crumble away. It won't be as fast as we talk directly, but it'll be more effective and longer lasting. And how do we transform ourselves now? Is by learning the Dharma. Learning the Dharma, contemplating, listening to Dharma teachings, meditating, contemplating, and putting that into our lives and creating a transformation. And that transformation today will create the new ideas about us tomorrow. I had a lot of bad experiences as a child, a lot, horrible, physical and mental, lots and lots of horrible physical abuse and mental abuse as a child. I choose to use those experiences to not create a further reputation for myself. I will not take the anger towards me and to put that anger towards others and to damage others. But I choose to take that anger to realize that I did something in a previous life to get that. Therefore, I accept it. By accepting, letting go, forgiving, I purify that karma. It's done. That karma is used. I can't use it anymore. It's like a paper cup or a paper plate. Once I use it, you can't let the other person use it again. It's done. But if I harp on it and I focus on it, I use it again and I do it again and I think about it and I do negative things in relation to it or I justify my actions by saying that it came from the fact that I was hurt and abused, no one at the end will accept that anymore. In the beginning for one or two, for, uh, one or two sessions, after that, not a continual basis. But people who don't want to take courage in doing something more and take action and responsibility, they will justify their actions from previous actions done to them. My husband was bad to me. My wife was bad to me. My husband cheated on me. My wife lied to me. My mother was bad to me. My father was a, was a womanizer. And they'll go on and on and on and use that as a continual excuse of their state of being now. Yes, maybe those had contributing factors. I agree. But right now, what is contributing to your downfall? Right now, what is contributing to your lack of knowledge and your explanations of others? What? is what you're doing now. So if those experiences can lead to what you are now, your experiences can lead to what you want to be tomorrow. So if in the past you had a rotten husband that cheated you, that lied to you, and therefore you're out in the cold and you're, you have to work like a slave, or in the past you had rotten parents that abused you and beat you and, 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 and did a lot of bad things to you, and you're out in the cold now, you didn't get education, you had a difficult time, yes, that's how you are now, and it happened. Accept it on a worldly level. But what about right now? You can't live the rest of your life based on what happened to you at that time and use that continuously. You can't because that is you grasping and holding on to a projection, to, an, to an, something that happened to you and not letting go. And you're still creating karma from that event. Example, my parents were very against me to practice Buddhism. They wanted me to go to college. They wanted me to get married. I already had the girl settled. Her name was Bemba, a very nice girl, because that's their way. And they wanted me to get an education, and I was threatened. 
My father told me if I marry a black girl, black one, he will hang me. He said he meant it. No Jews, no blacks. White girls can play with them and drop them off, but you marry a yellow girl. Best is your own race. If not Chinese, Japan can. That was his rule. Good or bad, I'm not trying to tell you. And they want me to go to college. They don't want me to go to Dharma. And they used to call up and say nasty things to my teacher, spread rumors about my teacher saying that he was having sex with everybody, it, all the females in the neighborhood. Some people believed, 90% didn't. It didn't matter. I didn't care. He, they did that. And if my mother was successful in stopping me from doing the Dharma, we wouldn't be here today. And my mother would have collected incredible negative karma. Because if I was to be a Dharma teacher and I am to touch a thousand people in my life, she would have stopped me from touching 1,000 people, which is much more than education. Because if I get an education, if I, if I have a degree, what's the guarantee me I'll be successful? What's the guarantee me I'll be a good person? What's the guarantee me that I'll be beneficial? Okay, I work a job, schlep, and get some money. What's the guarantee I'll even live long enough to do all that? What's the guarantee my mother will live long enough to do that? But I, I respect her and I pray for her and I make offerings for her because that's all she knew. That was her level of practice. That was her level of person. So her best and my father's best was that. They couldn't go any higher. But I, with respect to them, I knew more. I understood more. I knew what I had to do. I, ha I hate this word, but I had a calling. It was very deep. So I resisted. I fought. I ran away. I, I went away from my parents a lot. And I hurt my stepmother and stepfather tremendously because I wanted to do the Dharma. But I took courage because I didn't do it to hurt them. I did it because I knew what I needed to do. So when we stop people from doing Dharma, if it's real, it's genuine, it's incredible karma. When I was very young, when I was already seven months old, I was told by my nannies that they already recognized me as a reincarnation. They've already put on the golden robes, literally. And my mother refused me, my real mother at that time, refused me to be enthroned. And she told the monks who came to take me to the monasteries, if he's a real Rinpoche, when he grows up, he'll find his way. If I put him in now, don't know if he'll go right or wrong. Don't know if what you guys are saying is right or wrong. But when he grows up, he'll go the right way. So I was angry at the time, you know, when I was younger, when I heard this, but now I understand. My point is this, whatever happens to us, right now. Yes, it's based on something that happened to us in the past. But if we keep basing what we do now, tomorrow, the next day, the next week, the next year on what's happened to the past, we just keep living the way we are and go worse. Because as time comes, when age comes, when, when our metabolism slows down, when the energy and zest of youth goes away, it's very difficult. And if we have the energy and zest of youth, it's not a big deal either because most, most youths while their time is away at activities that destroy themselves eventually emotionally. So what we experience in the past, what we experience in the past and we base it on that experience and we do, and we keep holding on to it. This person was bad. This situation is bad. I was born poor. I was born in a, in, I lived in the streets. I slept outside. I was beaten. Someone cheated me. And we hold on to that. And we live that, and we do everything in relations to that, we lose on a worldly level. And everybody we wish to help, and every prayer that we say that we wish to benefit all sentient beings as we pray in Buddhism, is a farce, is a lie, is not true, and we're fooling ourselves. Why? If we can't even let go of something that happened that we actually created, maybe we're, we were a bitchy wife, maybe we're a demanding husband, Maybe we we're a nasty person that contributed to this person doing things to us. If we keep holding on to what happened and basing on those experiences and doing actions based on those experiences, we lose. Why? If we were at fault for what had happened, if we were at fault for what had happened, we are reinforcing that fault and we will do it again and again and again to the new people we meet. If we are not at fault, we are creating the fault because when we hold on to it and we act out of it, we create more karma to, in fact, have it happen again. 
Because if I say, oh, Cha was, he's my older brother and he was very mean to me when I was young. He used to beat me and he used to take my food away and take my toys and he did that for years. And then when I grow up, I, I, I become a successful business guy here and then I get him back and he's working in some, he's working as, some, uh, as a, a grease monkey somewhere fixing cars. And I get him back when he comes to ask for money, I make him kowtow and kiss my, kiss my ass. And I get him back. You see, what he did to me is over, but I do to him because I'm holding on to experience and I create more and more and more karma. Even for people who say, oh, I'm lazy. Oh, I'm not aware. Oh, I'm attached. Oh, I have desire. That's the way I am, but I'm working on it. BS. In fact, that itself is an attachment and a lame excuse for you to continue what you're doing to create yourself the next time. When you actually tell people, I'm full of desire, I'm lazy, I have bad speech, I'm not aware, I can't do this, I can't do that, I, you are reinforcing it because you are using that as an excuse not to become better. That is called attachment based on wrong projection that comes from the deepest suffering, ignorance. The third, no, the main factor for us to stay in samsara. So when we reinforce it over and over. I can't, I can't, I won't, I don't, I don't have time. I can't, I just can't, it's hard, I'll try. You know what's the worst word that puts you down when you say, I will try? It's very bad because you give yourself 50-50 that you won't. And if you know yourself, if you, you yourself have a reputation of not fulfilling your commitments and not doing what you're supposed to do and disappointing a lot of people, if you are that type of person, disappointing people letting people down, letting your anger take over, getting revenge, being lazy, not fulfilling your commitments. If you're that type of person, when you say, I will try, you allow yourself to fail. Some of you may think, oh, but that's my way of not letting people down. You're already letting them down because you already have the reputation of being that way. So what you need to say, I will and do it. Whatever reputation was made in the past can be changed to the future. So if you were this way, if you were orange in the past, you can be red in the future. If you are red today, you can be green the next day. Everything is based on you changing your reputation. Everything is based on you changing your reputation. So therefore, whatever you were, whatever you were, doesn't have to be tomorrow. Whatever you are now, doesn't have to remain. Whatever you want to be can happen now. Why? Because you put in what you want to be. You become what you put your energy towards. So if you are self-deprecating and you say you cannot and you say that you can't or you put yourself down by not doing because you base it on a past experience, then you're a very attached person. If you're a very attached person in Dharma, it's very hard to improve and become better. And the best way to let go of that attachment, the best remedy is realizing you're attached, listening to Dharma teachings on removal of attachment, collecting merit and doing practices to cut out that attachment. Because if it's attachment, it brings unhappiness. If it's attachment-based, it brings disaster. If it's attachment-based, it brings disharmony. If it's attachment-based, no matter how good things now are, no matter how good your motivation supposedly is, it will bring about unhappiness. Because the law and the, car, the law of samsara is everything is impermanent and will end. You need to remember that truth and you need to keep that in your mind. As long as we understand that truth, everything becomes easier. It's not something that's, that makes you depressed. It is something that actually helps you to become better. So, we need to let go of conventions, projections, cultures, upbringing, expectations of experiences as that will help us to let go. We will feel less at loss, we'll feel less loss, and we'll find a purpose in our lives. I repeat, due to past experiences, 
we hold on to conventions. If we're Chinese, at Chinese New Year's, everything must be red or we won't have fortune. Well, that means everybody who is not Chinese, everybody who doesn't have red on Chinese New Year's must be a failure. And then we get attached to that. What I'm saying here is I'm not putting down Chinese culture and 5,000 years of rich Chinese heritage. What I'm saying is if it suits everybody to have red, have red. If you go home to, to your family in Penang or Ipo or Dilo Antan or Greek or, or Kelantan or, or Tibet, and, and they want red and it makes them happy, put red. But if you go to another place and you have to have red and they don't want red, and then you, a big argument ensues, it's not a happy gongsi si facha, is it? What I'm saying is that, is that is conventions. That is things created by humans who don't have wisdom that says we need to do things in a certain way, otherwise good fortune or good things won't come. Celebrate Chinese New Year's. Wear red. Have red houses. Everything red. Be red. Hang out in Jalan Alor. Red. No problem. But if you're in a place that doesn't understand and know that, you don't have to have that and force it down people to say that I have to have it. Holding culture and holding convention can be beneficial, but if we do it wrong, it can be evil. It could hurt people. Similarly, projections. How we expect a situation to be, how we expect a person to be. Most of us, and you guys contemplate deeply, please, most of us suffer because we don't fulfill our projections. Most of us. We have a projection of how a certain situation must be. We have a projection of how people should be. We have a certain projection of how we must do certain things. And when we do it and that projection doesn't happen and it doesn't materialize as we have projected, we become angry. Why? Because of our upbringing, our culture, our background, and what we expect is false. Then we create sufferings for other people in other situations. Why? Other people don't have the same upbringing as us. Other people don't have the same values and thinking and culture and, and, and background as us. How can everybody be exactly like us and we have a false expectation of others? When we plant that false expectation on others and they don't do it and then we get into a cat fight, or we, we scold or, or we show a black face or we, we say nasty things, we create more sufferings for them and us. And if you don't believe in karma and religion and Buddha, no problem, but you can believe in humanity you don't create harmony and happiness by your projections. You don't create harmony and happiness when you actually do that to other people. Because if you don't believe in the next life, no problem. Believe in this life. Believe that if you do that, it, that, that's not right. And that's the beauty of Dharma and Dharma teachings, is that it can, apply, it can be applied to your life and it can benefit your life now. People who take time to listen to Dharma, people who make time for Dharma, people who do that, they have their priorities correct. I'll tell you why. You're not a religious fanatic. Whatever we do, whatever we put time toward, is to bring some kind of benefit to us. What's more beneficial than learning the most ultimate way of transforming our mind to bring benefit to others? So if we don't have any methods that are ultimate, we don't take time to learn, we don't make time for it, we have our priorities straight. And whatever we do will only be limited and stunted, and we cannot reach our full potential. Why? No matter how smart and good we are, there's someone better and smarter. Example, Buddha. So it's very important. How we act, how we talk, how we present ourselves, how we live is due to experiences or dreams. Dreams as in what we wanted to be, what we wanted to do, our hopes, better hopes, we had earlier in life or even a previous life. So sometimes it's hard to understand, but letting go and knowing it doesn't affect us anymore changes how we react now to what happened to changing, to, to what has happened. So changing in Dharma, with Dharma, by Dharma, creates new attitudes to experiences now and the future. So we don't create more negative reputation for ourselves, perpetuating negativity about ourselves and others and reaffirming our further negative actions. Meaning, meaning what? Whatever, however we're acting now, however we react to people now, whatever we're doing to other people now, is based on the experiences we had in the past and based on our hopes and dreams of the past. Based on that, whether they're false or real or not, based on that. So if we're creating a lot of negative karma, 
it's due to the experiences we had in the past, but not even that, if we go deeper, it's due to the reaction we had to the experiences in the past. People can be beaten and react positively. People can be beaten and react negatively. People, people deep Dharma practitioners who are beaten, they move on, they say, I purified my karma, I'll avoid that, it's okay, I forgive the person, and they don't create more harm. People who don't, they probably get revenge, they go kill, they get angry, and they become an angersome person, and they, get, they do more to other people. They maybe kill other people or beat other people. So the, re, the experience is there, and I don't deny that. Buddhism doesn't deny that. I don't deny the experience. What I deny is how we react to the experience. What we do in conjunction to that experience. And not just immediately after that experience, but next year, next year, next year, next year, even up till now. So what happened to us in the past is what we are now, yes. But what will happen to us in the future is what is happening to us now. And what will happen to us now, we will only know if we seek a higher wisdom to deal with it, to change it. That could be one higher wisdom is Buddha's Dharma. And that will affect. And if we continuously not put effort towards that, then what is happening to us now due to the reactions we had to experiences in the past, will continue until we die. And unfortunately, continue into our future lives. So if you are a great meditator in this life, you will be one in your next life, greater. If you practice Dharma very deep in your previous life, in this life, from a very young age, you'll seek the Dharma. If in your previous life, you, you sought after money, food, drugs, and sex, you will seek that now. If in your previous life you're always seeking financial security, you're always seeking some kind of um, praise and beauty and name and fame, you will seek that now. And unfortunately for people who seek things that are wrong, you won't go to hell. You create hell. Because in your seeking of it, you will not attain it. And when you attain so-called what you want that is based on attachment, you will create more negative karma for, you, for it to be taken away. That's true, whether you want to believe in Dharma or not. How beautiful you are, you will not be beautiful one day. How healthy you are, you will not be healthy. How young you are, you will not be. How rich you are, one day it will be taken away, lost, given away, or you leave it at the time of death. How many children you have, how attached you are to your children, one day they will leave the flock. If you set them the right way, wonderful. If you didn't set them the right way, they may make it, they may not make it. If you, if you, set them the right, if you don't set them the right way, they may make it. Ultimately, you have to let go. If you have wonderful parents that are taking care of you, giving you money, give you love, give you cars, food, house, everything that you want, they will be gone. And don't think that, oh, when they're gone, I have a big inheritance. Because if you don't have the merit to have it, if you don't have the luck, you say in Chinese, gong, right? If you don't have the luck to have it, when your parents are gone, they take their luck with them. So when their luck is gone, you're, you don't have luck anymore. You will go down. So a lot of kids, after their parents die, go down. A lot. I've seen it. Why? This is my job to interview people, to see people, to talk to people. I've met thousands, all levels, all cultures, all people. This is my job. So a lot of, I've met a lot of kids who come from extremely wealthy families. Once their parents are gone, the kids fall flat. They can't even get a job. They work somewhere cutting paper. And I'm not putting anyone down. Why? Because when they don't have the luck, but they live with someone who has the luck, they get something. Example, if you don't smell good, you stand next to someone that smells good, you can smell their smell was, and you can smell your smell too. Okay, so when you're around someone who smells good, you know, and, uh, and they smell really good, you know, because they put on Christian Dior, they put on passion or whatever, you know, and they drank the whole bottle. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they smell good, and, and someone comes near, everybody thinks, oh, you all smell so good. But the minute that person goes away, they smell you, they go, oh, you smell interesting. <laughs> Correct? Similarly, if your parents are very wealthy and you're there, everybody look at you, oh, you guys are so lucky. Wow. You're also rich, got everything. If your parents drop dead, they go away, they're, they're finished, they're no more, suddenly you're smelly. If you don't have the luck to have the wealth, you won't get a dime. I promise you, if I'm wrong, Buddha is wrong. I'm not backing what I set up with the Buddha. I'm backing, I'm telling you the truth by karma. So if you're riding high now and you're having a great time, and you're just living life, and you're just going along, you know, enjoying yourself and letting daddy and mommy give you everything, maybe your uncle, I wish I had one like that, but I don't. But anyways, and you're just going along. If they go off, if they pass away, they may have $10 billion to give you. They may have $10 billion. 
But if you don't have the luck to have it, maybe something goes wrong in the courts, a relative, someone, you can't get it. I promise you. So you better get your act together now. That's what I always tell myself. Similarly, that is for everything in life. If that person is very powerful and they smell good, once they're gone, your smell comes out because you go along with your karma. You think about that. Does that make sense? Is that logical? Even what I'm telling you now is Dharma talk. Even some of you have taken the time to now come listen to Dharma for one or two hours. When you leave here, you get more knowledge. That's what you get. That's what you do for yourself. I don't charge you. There's no entrance fee. I don't get anything from you if I give Dharma. There's no benefit for me. In fact, I take time away from watching movies. I bought some movies yesterday from Speedy. I'm dying to go home and watch it because I'm not attached. So I take time away from my personal life to come here to share knowledge with you that I've taken 20 years to learn through a lot of sacrifice living in a little house in India. Later it was a big house, but anyway, in the beginning it was a little hut. <laughs> living under my teachers. So when you leave here after two hours, you did something for yourself. You got knowledge that is over 2,500 years old from the Buddha. You win. So if you make the effort, you stay away, you put yourself here and you sit and you listen, you win. So if you're having a great life now because your parents are giving it to you, your company's giving it to you, your girlfriend's giving it to you, your wife's giving it to you, your husband's giving it to you, your boyfriend's giving it to you, your, your, your lover's giving it to you, whatever, however you're getting it, you have to make sure that if they're gone, you have the luck to continue that way of life. Because if you don't, no joke. So don't be riding high now. And some of us who are riding high now without any personal effort, let me tell you something. According to Ken Serumji, it's a speedy way of burning up your merits, not have anything later. Meaning, if I live with my father and he takes care of everything of me, I don't take responsibility for myself in any way, shape, or form. And I just live the good life and I just go plopping along here and there and there, there, blah, whatever. And I don't do anything. I don't take advantage of that. And example, if I'm being taken care of, I go for education, I improve myself, I work harder, I establish myself, and I do something with my life. Even though I'm being sheltered by my father, my uncle, my company, my friend, whatever, I'm being sheltered. So that even if I fall, I can make sure I make it. So that when they're gone, I am making it on my own merits. Religiously and worldly. Whereas if they're sheltering me now and I don't take care of myself and I don't do something, when their shelter is gone and their shelter was from them and not me, I will fall. And what Ken Sermji says is, in fact, that type of person who uses their opportunity for not improving, but using the opportunity for just enjoying and laying around, they use up their merit faster and quicker so that when this umbrella or this parent or this person is gone, they will fall even heavier. And I've seen that in my own family with my own brothers. One of them died of cancer just last year, 42, 43. Why? My father is very wealthy in Taiwan. I don't get anything because I'm only, they're from different mothers. They're, my brothers are very good looking, very handsome, very tall. They're in all the sex gossip magazines. They send it to me to see which actress they're sleeping with in, in, in Taiwan. Not that I care. I don't know why they send that to me. Yeah, some of you have seen the magazines my brother sends me, that he slept with this girl, and he, he's uh, Dalai Lama's best friend. Anyways, never mind. And, and yeah, and uh, one of them got apartments and houses from my father, and he died of cancer because he overdrank and oversmoked and overpartied. He never worked one day in his life. He lived off the salary he got from renting the apartments my father gave him, and he literally died from a good life last year. Many of you know that. My sister took land from my father and got three, four US million dollars out of it and just disappeared to another part of Taiwan, never contacted him again. My other brother now is living under the umbrella of my father. But what I'm saying is my father has throat cancer, but is okay now, in remission. My point is, when my father's umbrella is gone, they will suffer tremendously. Because when we live under someone's luck and merits, and we live under someone's money and fortune and good luck, no matter how close they are to us, when they're gone, we will get it. And you know what's sad? The people and friends around us who are after that, they will disappear very fast. Because that's what happened to my brothers. I'm not telling you from a Dharma book. I'm not telling you from what I read. I'm telling you from my own experience, and it matches what Buddha says. So don't think that I had a good life, that I've been living in a golden palaquin in, in the Potala Palace in Tibet. No, I was living on the streets of LA, hustling. 
No, I didn't have a good life. So if we are going to live and be the way we are now, please enjoy what you have. But at the same time, work for your future. Whether you want to do it from a dharma base, karma, or you want to do it on a self-preservation base, do it. Because what you have now is based on the past. But the past cannot always become the future. And then you will use your merits up very fast. And may I tell you very honestly and directly without any, um, any negativity at all, is that when I woke up, I thought about all this. Must be the crowd coming. I didn't know who's coming. I don't know who's coming. But I wrote all this down already before I came. So if any of you in the audience think I'm pinpointing you, I am not. I've written this down before I came. And I highlighted the ones in red that are very important. And it's just, I'm almost done. It's just one and a half pages. So I don't know who's coming. But with me, it's very strange because depending on the crowd, it depends on what I want to talk about. So I get an inspiration. I know what I want to say. And I know what I want to do. And I know what I want to do. So I write everything down. I come, I just talk. And some people in audiences, and many times in the past many years, think I'm pinpointing them. I am not. I do not do that. I would like to, but I control myself. I've written it down, it's in red, and I want to talk. And it's always inspired by the karma of the crowd that's coming. So it's not to pinpoint anyone. So I don't mean any disrespect to anyone here at all. Don't take it in that way. At the same time, so people who don't finish practices, don't finish preliminaries, don't finish their sadhanas, not committed to retreats, don't base your practice on time or minimum number is required, but based on attainments, understanding only. Those who want to do practices, those who want to do attainments, those who want to do preliminaries, those who want to do sadhanas, those who want to do dharma practices, please don't look at the minimum number required. Preliminaries are 100,000 each. But that is the minimum for you to just start at. If you are going to become attained by 100,000, that's fine. But if you need a million, to be attained. You don't say, I want to finish quickly, quick, 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 and I want to just get over my preliminaries. Lama Tsongkhapa did 3,500,000 mandala offerings to the medicine Buddha. I I'm sorry, to the 35 confessional Buddhas. The preliminary is 100,000. So you don't sit there and say, I want to get the preliminaries done. I want to do my sadhana. And you just focus on the number. Because if you focus on a number, you defeat the practice. The whole purpose of your practice is to gain attainments, not to finish the number. You use the number as a measuring stick of Time, example, okay, I'll do 100,000 and rest. Okay, I'll do another 100,000 and rest. Okay, I'll do another 20,000 and rest and take a break because we're not advanced until I reach a point that I can do it continuously and it becomes pleasure. So you don't do sadhanas. Even when you do sadhanas, oh, I have to do 21 thadas. And then, okay, I go pati, I go run punky pintang. No, you don't do that. Why? Because then you're not doing practice for the sake of gaining attainment. You're doing it because... You're attached to numbers and promises and reputation and looking good so the next time Temeramji sees you, he don't shout at you. That's not the purpose you should do your practice. So if you have time, don't do 21, do 22, 23. Don't be attached to numbers, practices, preliminary. Those are very basic guidelines the high lamas have set forth for. Do you think everybody in this room by doing 100,000 will become Buddha? Some people, 10,000 become Buddha. No. <laughs> Some people need 200,000. So do you think that 100,000 settles everybody's problem in samsara? I don't think so. Use your brain. Some people say, I want to do our chair. I want to do our chair. And they want to finish 100,000. I finish 100,000. You look at me. Oh my God, you need another 100,000. Mary. Yeah. And they're attached to numbers. Why? How can that number suit everybody in samsara? But it says in Lamrim. Oh God. It's a basis, just a base on Example, if you're going to do business and they tell you you can be successful in three years and you're not, do you quit? No, you try four, maybe five years you become successful. Some people maybe only one year, maybe two years. Some people go for lottery, 4D every week. I know people who go every week religiously Sunday, they must go there and buy 4D. Sometimes win, sometimes don't win, but they go, like, like meditation, they go. <laughs> some people win in one week, some people win in one year. No! But you don't, you keep doing it. It's just a measuring stick. They go once a week, but they write a book. They can say, you don't have to go once. You can go every day. You can go every, once every two weeks, once a month. It's just a general rule. And then when you request things from your guru, 
You don't, you don't put a noose on him. Give me the refuge file so I kill you, Rinpoche. Oh, yes, sir. I mean, you know, you, you don't request your guru for things. You don't ask things from your guru, and you demand, you push, and you turn and twist them to your timing, to the way you want it, to the way your schedule fits. No. Do you want to become a Buddha? Or is this another business deal? Or are you meeting another date? When you want vows, when you want initiations, when you want teachings, when you want practice, you don't twist, manipulate, force, beat, bribe your guru, your teacher to do it the way you want. You do it the way they want because that's why they're your teacher. Otherwise, you get on the throne. So when you request for things, you do it humbly. You do it according to the time that the teacher gives you. And you practice patience toward it because perhaps they're training you up. Think. Think. And don't be afraid to practice Dharma. Don't be afraid to be different. Be yourself, but be better. I hate that. That's from fitness first. They wear that t-shirt in the gym. Be yourself, but be better. I'm like, oh. But I thought that's pretty Dharma. Don't be afraid to practice or be embarrassed to practice with your friends, Dharma or not. Irregardless of how they view you, what your reputation will be, how they think of you, practice. It doesn't matter. But don't go crazy. If you're in a family, they're all Christian or they're Jews or they're not, they don't like what you're doing. They think you're going to be a nun or they think you're going to be a monk and you sit there, they're going to have din din. Say, I won't eat meat. I'm Buddhist. Oh, please, just eat it. It's been made. Because to change them, you need to change yourself. So if you're in a situation that's very difficult, you don't change yourself. Outerly, you change. Internally, you do the offering. Example, you do the meat offering. You, blow, you don't need to show them. You don't have to go, oh. <laughs> and then you take the big, you know, the, you take the big, um, uh, 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 what's it, KFC chicken that you got in front of everybody, go, and you show everybody how holy you are. Oh. <laughs> now, the, this chicken will take rebirth as a god. And when I eat it, there'll be no karma. And then, <laughs> no. Dharma practice is not another vehicle for you to show off and show everybody how holy you are. No. So if you're in a situation where you're with a bunch of people who won't accept what you're doing, you don't put yourself down and you don't diminish your practice and diminish the Buddha and diminish your, who you are and what you're confident in because the Buddha is not wrong. Buddhism and Dharma is not wrong. But it is not wrong, but do you have the power, the knowledge, the practice, the presence and the ability and the practice to show that it's not wrong? If you don't have that, but what you have is right, it still will not come out right. If you're a bum on the street and you show somebody a yellow piece of metal and say it's gold, of course they won't believe you. If you pull up in a Mercedes and you're holding a Gucci bag and you got Gucci glasses and your cell phone's made of gold and you got a platinum card and you say this, this is a piece of brass, you say it's gold, they'll believe you. I'll tell you why. I bought a Pasa Malam Louis Vuitton LV wallet. 60 ringgit from Penang. Patu Fringi. I showed it to one of my friends. I won't tell you who, but got big title one. And everything they have is real. I said, do you think it's real? They said, oh, if you have it, definitely it's real. Because they figured someone offered it to me. I said, no, no, take a look. They looked at it, they stitched. They said, good stitching? Yes. I was thinking, <laughs> I swear to God, it was from Patu Fringi. I bought three LV wallet. I'm not saying that I can carry it. I'm nobody, but since I'm a Rinpoche, they think people offer it to me, so I probably have the real thing. People are not going to offer me things from Pasa Malam, right? <laughs> yeah. So if you had the quality that if you're in a group of people and they're wild, they're obnoxious, they're crazy, they're, they're running around with no bra on and all that, right? And then you say, no, that's bad karma. And then they change. Yes, they will. If the Dalai Lama shows up a bunch, among all of us and tells us, don't, we'll do it because of who he is. But if look at me. Look at yourself and you go with your friends. Instead of you pulling them up, they drag you down, down, down. You don't want to go, they're dragging you. No, I don't want to go to three lower rounds. No, you're there. Think about it. So when you're with people that you can't influence because of your personal practice and your level, instead of making a big show to convert them, you don't do that. You do it internally. 
So if you're with a family situation, you're with friends, you're with people, and they don't accept what you're doing, they will with time because of who you are and how strong you are. Not strong in showing off and changing them and turning them around and going against them, but strong that whatever they do, they cannot influence you, but you practice internally, inside. You think about that. And with your friends, when you go out with friends, when you go eat and stuff like that, you can be who you are. You can be strong, you can be powerful, you can be in the Dharma, you can be very good. But you may not change them immediately. Why? Because of who you are. But you should not be embarrassed to practice the Dharma. You should not be ashamed. And you should not let the power of samsara and other negative karma bring your practice down. Because you need to be confident. From what? From knowledge, from study, from contemplation and from the collection of merits. The last point. Sometimes what we do, say, or teach people we love and don't love doesn't change them even after a long time. But it changes us and has a profound impact on us to gain strength, knowledge, diligence to continuously talk and help. Our disappointment with certain people is our attachment to results, sometimes an ego trip. So sometimes we find that we talk to people, we explain the Dharma to them, we say it again and again, and we do it out of love, good motivation, whatever. And it doesn't change them, friends or whatever. And even after a long time, and we get disappointed, we get angry, maybe we get, we get disgusted. We shouldn't because although they may have not changed, we create a profound impact on ourselves. What is that? We gain the courage to do things even though it doesn't bring the expected result at the expected time that we want. Do you think that everybody I teach Dharma to, they become a Bodhisattva overnight? No. If Dharma teachers were to, be, were to be, have the strength from their students to teach Dharma, there will be no Dharma teachers. Because the amount of time that Dharma teachers put to the students is never given back an equal amount or even close to it. Never. Many students, and I'm talking about my gurus and myself to my guru, Many students disappoint their teachers severely, not small, severely. They hurt their teachers very much. They disappoint them because they, they come up with all kinds of weird excuses not to do things. They play mind games. They play with time. They always say they, don't, they can't. They disappoint them. They make a promise and break it. They don't realize that whatever they do with the Dharma teacher, they help. Through the Dharma teacher, they help many people. So when they disappoint the Dharma teacher, they tell them they can't, they don't have time, they can't adjust, they can't move, they can't do anything. They disappoint the Dharma teacher very much. And when they disappoint the Dharma teacher, they disappoint the highest point in their life. What is that? Their self-improvement. Because if you can manipulate all this with your Dharma teacher, your Dharma teacher represents your Dharma. So you can manipulate your future in a negative way. So Dharma teachers show non-disappointment and that their practice and their effort towards others is not based on attached results. It's based on compassion. To do it again and again and again and never to give up. That outer forces and outer situations can affect them because their practice comes from their merits and their compassion and their state of being that they have developed. The who they are represents why they never give up. So, when you put that effort out to people, friends, family, and other people, you should, never get, you should never get disappointed. You should never think, I didn't get a result. I'll tell you why. You did get a result. You made a very profound impact on yourself. And that profound impact is you're rehabituating your effort not to be attached to results, to benefit out of love and care. And you make that. And you do it again and again. And what happens? You change. You transform in the process. You become better. And then after one year, two year, three year, the very people you're trying to help and change, you will change them. You will touch their lives. You will be able to transform them by your strength. And if they don't change in this life, you have put a profound impact on them. Because if you do your practice well, they will come to the Dharma in a future life. Because it says in the Vajrayogini Tantra very clearly, those who practice Vajrayogini hold their vows, has samaya to their gurus, and does their tzok commitments well. Whoever sees them, hears them, has any exposure to them in any way, shape, or form, by that exposure, they will plant Vajugini seeds in their mind. Any questions? 
Any questions? Louder. Oh, you've already backtracked it. Do you know why? She asked if you've done something in accordance with an experience in the past and, and you realize that what you've done is wrong. What do you do now? You've already done something because you realize it's wrong. And then you contemplate on the time you wasted by focusing on that. And the years or the months or days or whatever you've wasted by doing that. You contemplate again and again and you think about it. You don't have to sit there like, oh, you can sit there, have a banana and just in, in a coffee, have a ciggy bud and think about it. Yes, because why? Thinking about it again and again is a type of meditation. There are two types. That meditation is called analytical meditation. It helps you to change your mind and habits. Why? You meditate to the point where you're so disgusted with yourself about that that you transform. If someone's giving you something to eat and it's actually poisonous, creates cancer, you didn't know, but you're addicted to it, wouldn't you give it up eventually once you know? It might take you time because of your addiction, right? But knowing is already there. So when you know that, that's very good. When you know that, it is not even the first step. It's like the fifth step up to 10 steps. So what you do is you contemplate on what happened. You contemplate how you reacted, how it affected people, how much time you wasted, what you could have done instead. And then if you can, you add Dharma knowledge to it to see an alternative. And do an alternative. Because that's what you are now from that. But what you're going to be tomorrow is what you're doing now. So even the two, three hours you sat here listening to Dharma, I'm sure you got knowledge. With this knowledge you apply, and I'm sure some of the things you do is going to be different than before you attended this course. Why? Because it's knowledge. And we are intelligent. Along with that, we do preliminary practices and practices. And we get more knowledge, because the more knowledge we get, the better we can root out what we've done and how we reacted. How to root it out, now you need to get the method. And the method is Dharma. Questions? No, karma can be exhausted. Merits cannot. I might have did a slip up, sorry. Yes? That's it? Okay. Questions? Overcoming subtle defilements that make you do actions that bring harm and unhappiness to yourself cannot be removed at the level you are now. That is definite. That is in the Lamrim. Three principal paths also. But whatever you remove on a gross and coarse level will lead to you removing the subtle level. Because why even approach the subtle level when the gross level has not been overcome? So when you remove the gross level, it leads to the subtle level. It is a path. So if you want to go to Banda Utama from here, I'm sorry, if you want to go to KL from here, you have to go past PJ. So how can you say, I want to go to KL without going through PJ? Something similar like that. So at this moment, you should have a realization that you have subtle, grow, a subtle, very subtle levels of imprints that are difficult to remove at this moment. Yes, and you make prayers. That's what we call aspirational prayers. That's what we're going to do in a Lamrim in an intensive Saraswati class. The aspirational prayers plant the seeds for you to actually remove the, the subtle levels in the future. Because whatever we wish to do, we need to have aspiration first. Even in life, I want to be a fireman. I want to be an actor. We have to have the aspiration first. So when we do aspirational prayers, it is a commitment in us, and we are directing that prayer to the three jewels, which has power to bless us, to open up the seeds in the future, to remove those defiled, subtle imprints. So in the beginning, we take vows, and we hold on to that. If we're in Tantra, we listen to our Vajra master, and we listen to what he says, and we do the practices. By doing that, it will lead to the removal of those subtle imprints. Do you understand? Questions? Very good. Mm -hmm. That's what I said earlier, and that's exactly what I read. Our other perceptions of us 
is as we perceive them because of our previous experiences. So if we're perceiving others incorrectly and therefore we react incorrectly, that is also based on a past experience. Example, if this person is always stealing from me and they reform, they become a good Catholic, they confess, they met the Pope and they say, I ain't gonna do it again and they become a monk now, a Catholic monk, they don't do it. But if we see them, we still believe they did it because we didn't know that all this happened. But we're still basing our perception of them on the experiences we had before. Therefore, if we're attached to the experiences we had before, it still creates a wrong perception of us toward others, not others toward us alone. Both ways. I mentioned that very clearly earlier. Both ways. Therefore, when we stop this type of attachment and we realize where the problem comes from, both ways get cut. But our way to them is faster because we're dealing with one. Their way to us is less because they don't have that much exposure to us and there are more of them. And you're dealing with different levels of mentality. Understand? Very good. Questions, please? Good. Koki? When the holy object comes to you, all you have to do is fold your hands, put your head down, it's placed on here, that's all, all right? Ms. Paris, would you have bless everyone with a Tara? Um, when you bless people with a Tara, you face it towards them, all right? You don't bless it with a rear end. But it's okay, it's Tara's rear end anyway, it's Buddha's rear end, what? Okay, so you face it towards them. Here you go. <laughs> Can I give you a blessing? Here you go. Can I give you one more? Can I give you a flower blessing? Here you go. There you go. Give everybody a blessing. Recite Um Tari Tu Tari Tori Sa while you're doing it. Um Tari Tu Tari. Uh, not loud and interrupt me because I'm the star here. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. You, you can recite Lama Tsongkhapa's mantra when you're doing it. Don't think your blessing. It's that. Okay? Go ahead. Okay, good, thank you, thank you. Today you spent time and energy to be in the Dharma class and to listen. And you even have the merits to be, remain seated and to be there and to listen. Some of us, even if they're in front of lamas, they're in the Dharma talk, they're in it, they can't hear or they can't take it because lack of merits to improve themselves. Those type of people, usually later they go down because they don't even have the merits to be able to listen. Not to me, to the Dharma. Listening to me has nothing to do with merits. I'm just a normal person. So think of it in that way. It's very, very important, all right? And uh, please do attend Dharma class. Please listen, because I'll tell you why. It's for yourself, and you will get knowledge. We don't do anything here crazy and fanatical. We don't do anything bad. I don't tell you to throw your family away. I don't tell you to change your life, change your custom. I just give you knowledge, and you do what you want with it. There's nothing crazy here. I am a cult, but I don't have a definition of a cult. I'm a cult leader, but I don't have the definition of cult leader, unfortunately. If I did, I'd be filthy rich. I'd love it. We all be living in Guyana somewhere. Where there's no Dharma, let there be the Dharma. Where there's Dharma, let it become stronger. Where there's a misunderstanding of Dharma, let it become clear. By our presence, wherever we go, whatever we do, may we plant Dharma seeds in other people. Dharma seeds meaning the seed of correct view and correct thought. Where there's unhappiness and where there's suffering and where there is Tremendous, tremendous despair by our presence. May we be able to relieve it and change it and transform it. In this life and in future lives, may it always be protected, blessed, and washed by qualified teachers that can guide us, help us, and lead us to a higher path. May we always have the wisdom. May you always have the merits. Be able to listen to the teachers and to follow their advice because their advice and their teachings will transform our lives. May all beings everywhere, plagued by suffering of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. 
May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn out with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing. May the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth. Those weak with sorrow find joy. May the hopeless find hope, constant happiness, and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all the medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be free from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be free. May the powerless find power and the people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I remain too to dispel the miseries of the world. With the determination to accomplish the highest welfare for all sentient beings who surpass even a wish-granting jewel, I will learn to hold them supremely dear. Whenever I associate with others, may I hold myself the lowest among all and respectfully hold others to be supreme from the depths of my heart. In all actions, I will learn to search into my mind. And as soon as an afflictive emotion arises endangering myself and others, I will firmly face and avert it. I will learn to cherish all beings of bad nature and those pressed by strong sins and sufferings as if I found the precious treasure difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me with badly with abuse, slander, and so on, may I suffer the defeat and offer the victory to others. When one who I have benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In, in short, I will learn to offer to everyone without exception all help and happiness directly and indirectly and respectfully take upon myself all harm and suffering of sentient beings. I will learn to keep all these practices undefiled by the stains of the eight worldly conceptions and by understanding all phenomena as illusions be released from the bondage of attachment. <laughs> Jewa Lozan Jobai Denba Yudin Banjuji.